Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Dental CE Academy and our symposium today, Advancing Oral Systemic Health. A little bit of housekeeping here. Please be sure you're using Chrome browser for the most optimal audio and video experience. I also want to refer you to our chat area. You'll see instructions to download the course folder. It will include CE credit instructions as well. At the conclusion of the live presentation today, all attendees will be emailed a link to complete a brief quiz for CE credit from no reply at clickmeeting.com. So at this time, I am very pleased and honored to introduce to you Dr. Tom Palmeyer, a cum laude graduate of the, the Ohio State University College of Dentistry class of 87. He completed a GPR at St. Elizabeth Medical Center in Youngstown, Ohio. He has been in private practice in Canton, Ohio since 1988. He's on the faculty of the Cleveland Clinic Mercy Hospital GPR in Canton, and he's a fellow in the International and American College of Dentists. He was a member of the ADA and American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons expert panels who wrote the clinical practice guidelines and appropriate use criteria for antibiotic prophylaxis for prosthetic joint patients. If you've taken um, his antibiotic course on our website, um, then you're familiar with him. If you're not, we highly recommend it. He also was a co-author of the ADA Clinical Practice Guidelines for Appropriate Antibiotic Use for Odontogenic Infections and was the 2019 recipient of the ADA Evidence-Based Dentistry Clinical Practice Award. He was one of six dentists appointed to the ADA Dental Practice uh, Recovery Task Force during the COVID-19 pandemic. And he regularly lectures to dental residents and students at Case School of Dental Medicine, NYU Langone Medical Center, and he's a vice chair of the Cleveland Clinical Clinic, excuse me, Mercy Hospital, board and chairman of the Cleveland Clinic Mercy Development Foundation. He is also past president of the Ohio Dental Association. Um, we do want to thank Perio Protect, our sponsor today, for bringing him to all of us. And this is an amazing opportunity for all of you. So thank you for being here and joining us. And Dr. Palmer, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Dr. Rowling, and uh, welcome. Today, we will look at um, the oral health systemic health connection. And I put what's the evidence there because I think as a profession, um, we need to be evidence-based. And when we talk with our patients, our professional colleagues in both dentistry and medicine, we should rely on the best possible evidence that's there and not just simply what we see in the mainstream media. So we'll go through a little bit about um, how we uh, can evaluate the evidence and uh, apply it to our uh, clinical practice. Again, I have no financial disclosures. Um, we do certainly thank Perio Protect for sponsoring this seminar and appreciate their support. Um, so when we look at um, this connection, a couple questions that we would ask, are there systemic medical conditions which cause or lead to the progression of periodontal disease or periapical pathology? And does periodontal disease or periapical pathology cause or lead to the progression or, or worsening of systemic medical conditions? Now, today, we're not going to look at periapical pathology, just simply periodontal disease, as there's not a lot of research related to um, periapical pathology and um, systemic health. But it is an emerging topic, and we know the types of bacteria that are associated with chronic periapical um, lesions in endodontic lesions certainly can have an impact and, and diabetics can have an impact on the healing as well. But today we're gonna to cover primarily periodontal disease. Um, back in the late 1800s and early 1900s, the focal infection theory was um, something that was uh, uh, brought to the scene and, and accepted and led to um, prophylactic edentialism of patients uh, removing all of their teeth to try and cure systemic diseases. It kind of gave dentistry um, a bad name related to medicine in that um, clearly doing that did not lead to better outcomes in medical care and obviously um, uh, led to inability to eat and proper nutrition. But we know that there can be metastatic spread of infection from the, uh, the mouth as a result of transient bacteremia. And we know that bacteria get in the bloodstream from normal daily routine activities uh, 
such as brushing and flossing our teeth, as well as eating, and up to 90 hours um, of uh, bacteria in the bloodstream per month just from those simple activities, let alone dental procedures. Um, we know that metastatic injury can occur from the many cytokines and bacterial toxins that are actually in the periodontal pockets and do get into the bloodstream. And that it also uh, leads to um, uh, an immune response and cytokine storms can actually occur because of primed neutrophils that are in the bloodstream um, from periodontal disease. So we know that the focal infection theory, while as applied in the late 1800s and early 1900s was certainly incorrect, we know that bacteria do get into the bloodstream and certainly impact um, other areas of the body. And we know that 35 to 55% of infective endocarditis are related to group viridan strep and directly from the mouth. And we know that Helicobacter pylori um, is related to ulcers and gastric cancer as well. So there's a lot of challenges to conducting quality research to say what are the associations and links and even potentially causality between um, oral pathogens and systemic diseases. But first and foremost, how do we actually define periodontal disease? And not what we consider from the AAP or the European Association of, of uh, uh, Periodontology, but how do we define it in research when we're going to look at patients and say, how do we correlate um, periodontal diseases, systemic diseases? Do we look at attachment loss or pocket depths, bone loss, bleeding on probing, or mobility? All of those can, have been used in research and are. Um, or do we use surrogate markers such as tooth loss and edentulism, which is the final stage of periodontal disease, but also um, may not be accurate because we can lose our teeth for a variety of reasons and not just periodontal disease. And then is there a clinical exam done by calibrated examiners and dentists, or is it simply a chart review uh, going back through and relying on what their dentist charted as periodontal disease? Or do we ask the patient and get a patient self-report? And then how long has it been since um, periodontal disease was diagnosed? Um, what were the treatment protocols? Did you have root planning or root planning and surgery? Was antibiotics um, uh, given in addition to therapeutic uh, uh, and surgical methods? And then what was the patient's response to those treatments? And did they uh, comply with their maintenance or did they have uh, relapse or refractory cases? And then the length of time following treatment and the disease improvement. So all of these things are challenges to be able to do research and there's no standardization within this and it would certainly help if there were. And then finally, we have confounders because we know a lot of things such as smoking um, actually uh, contribute to things like lung cancer, but also uh, worsen periodontal disease. So we have to be able to eliminate the confounders uh, when we're doing these studies as well. And that's a challenge. Uh, currently, nearly a third of all periodontal research is related to the oral health systemic health connection, looking at 57 different systemic disease conditions, everything from um, erectile dysfunction to Alzheimer's disease. Um, there are bidirectional relationships, and, and um, uh, we look at those particularly in diabetes. When we look at the research, we have to realize that the majority of research we're going to see are observational studies versus randomized controlled trials, which would be considered the gold standard when you're going to look at the evidence pyramid and how are we going to look at the study that's done and say, can we put that credibility and the results of that and apply it into our clinical practice? Um, and observational studies um, can be very, very good, but we have to realize that um, observational studies um, were the first uh, type of studies to link smoking and lung cancer, but observational studies also uh, linked hormone replacement therapy in uh, uh, menopausal women in a reduction of heart uh, disease. And then that was later actually debunked by randomized controlled trials. So we have to be cautious about where we um, uh, apply causality versus simply association when we look at studies. And then again, surrogate evidence versus direct evidence. Um, surrogate evidence is, is uh, again, edentulism versus actually per periodontal disease. And then finally, the methodology of the studies, which can vary um, by researchers, obviously. As I said, randomized controlled trials are what we want to look for. Um, participants are assigned by chance to separate groups that compare different treatments. You cannot choose the group. There has to be a control, either a placebo or a no intervention group. But there's ethical considerations when you look at 
um, uh, trying to do these when you're studying periodontal disease to have patients where you know periodontal disease can lead to tooth loss and ask them to not um, uh, undergo treatment for a period of time to see how it impacts their systemic conditions. Um, that's uh, an ethical con consideration and a challenge. So the strongest evidence about a particular intervention would come from a randomized controlled trial with a low risk of bias and large sample sizes. There's a lot of research terminology that you'll see, and we won't go through all of it, but I want to highlight a few so that when you look at um, studies in the literature, you might have a little better idea of things that I used to just pass over. What's the odds ratio or hazard ratio or relative risk? But the odds ratio is what you'll most likely see, and that's the measure of association between the exposure and the outcome. But the thing that I want you to look at also, and that I never even knew what it meant and just breezed through it, was the 95% confidence interval. That's the range of values that you can be 95% certain contains the true mean. Um, so you can say with certainty um, that that, it, uh, would, would, that percentage would apply. Narrow versus wide is what you wanna look at for precision. So if you have a confidence interval um, that's very, very wide and, and is say 1.01 to 1.88, that means there's either, and they would take the mean between that, and so it would be a, a 44, a 1.44, meaning a 44% increase odds of something happening with that intervention or that periodontal disease impacts, uh, say, cardiovascular disease. But it means it could be as low as 1% or as high as 88%. And when you have a wide confidence interval like that, there's not much precision, and I don't put a lot of faith in those statistics. And then a meta-analysis just simply combines the results of multiple studies that maybe had lower numbers of participants in them so that you can see a larger size effect, um, and it can and help ferret out where there's heterogeneity between different studies um, where they may agree or disagree. And then a p-value, um, is something you'll see and it determines statistical significance when it's uh, less than 0.05. So um, a, a quick review of some of the terminology you'll see when you read, read um, uh, studies, but most importantly is just understanding others will do that work for you. But as clinicians, I think we have an obligation to understand a little bit what we read and be able to say for ourselves, should I rely on the conclusions that are there? Clinical practice guidelines are, the, are, are what are determined by expert panels that look at all the research, do systematic reviews of everything that's uh, been researched, and then they come to conclusions related to that. And so that's where we should, should look to either a clinical practice guideline or a meta-analysis and sy systematic review. When you look at primary studies, again, randomized controlled trials, followed by cohort studies, then case control studies, Finally, case reports and then animal or laboratory studies, which is kind of where everything starts in clinical practice. There are a lot of barriers to integrating uh, evidence-based dentistry into our practices as clinicians. Uh, first, we must be able to understand and evaluate the literature, and that's hard to do because we didn't get that training. Then we need to know where to look for credible information. Um, and, and oftentimes there's resistance to change long-held clinical dogmas that we were taught in dental school or maybe our postdoctoral training um, and that we've always done. And now there's new evidence to show that maybe that isn't the way we should be thinking and it's just hard to change. And it's, it generally can take 20 years or a generation before we'll see that type of change in actual clinical practice. And then we, we each rely on our own clinical experience and that of our peers that we share our experiences with. And that's appropriate certainly to do. That is good evidence. And then it's just time to, to be able to attend CE like this or to read the journals uh, because we're all busy, busy clinicians and uh, with our patient care. So where should we look for journals? We want to look at peer-reviewed journals um, uh, such as JADA, the Journal of Evidence-Based Dental Practice, our specialty journals from Amos and Perio and other specialties, and then Journal of the American Medical Association, the New England Journal, and Journal of the American Heart Association called Circulation. But one of the best places to go if you want to find information is the Cochran Library, because they will look at, again, all the literature that's out there about a certain topic, and they will come to conclusions with that. The problem is that it may be outdated for what you want to look at, because they can't look at every area of interest continuously. So some of them may be five or 10 years old when you go to the Cochran Library, but it's a great resource. 
to be able to use. However, when you look at journal articles, and this was in JADA, April of 2019, misinterpretations, mistakes are just misbehaving. Even in well done peer reviewed journals, we see a lot of spin and you'll see um, titles such as the risk of colon cancer is 18% higher if you eat processed meat. Well, that's scary. And when you see that in the mainstream media, I think maybe I had to cut out the steaks and pork chops. Um, but the, the, the risk of colon cancer itself is 4.5% for the general population. So when you have an 18% risk in the study that's done, it means the absolute risk only increases by 0.8% from 4.5 to 5.3. Well, I like my steaks and pork chops, so I'm going to continue reading, uh, eating them. And so you have to be cautious when you just read the headline for what's there. And then we need to look at what are the author's conclusions? Are they supported by the evidence that's there? And oftentimes it isn't. So you have to be able to ferret through that. And then we need to look at the methodology. Um, sometimes literally they uh, hypothesize after the results are known and say, this is what we were looking for. Or they have improper study designs, uh, uh, inappropriate statistical tests and analysis. That's harder for us to analyze and so, um, but JADA and many other good um, uh, organizations will actually uh, kind of review these for you and you can just get a synopsis and rely on those. So do we read the abstract or do we read the entire article? I was an abstract reader for years and I still scan them very much, um, but we're missing a lot if we don't go to the full text. Spin and abstracts of randomized controlled trials in dentistry. And this again was in JADA January, 2020. And they looked at 75 abstracts of randomized controlled trials from nine peer reviewed journals, very good journals where there were statistically non-significant primary outcomes meaning that what they were looking for actually wasn't the results that they got. And 31% of the time there was spin in their conclusion. So they either claimed there was clinical significance, even when there may not have been the primary outcome supported by the uh, conclusions, or they emphasized uh, a significant secondary outcome, what they really weren't studying for. So we have to be cautious when we simply look at the abstract. And I know oftentimes I would look at abstracts and I would just jump to the conclusions. I don't wanna even read what the results were. I want the conclusions only. And I understand that as busy clinicians, it's easy to do. But I think it is important that we, we have the ability to uh, analyze and critically appraise uh, the evidence that's presented to us in our professions. You'll look at association versus causality, and we need to be able to distinguish between them. Causality requires evidence that the factor precedes the disease. So a patient had periodontal disease before they had diabetes or cardiovascular disease or whatever you're um, studying. Causality requires evidence of the knowledge of the mechanism of action of the risk factor on the disease. So is there biologic plausibility? How does periodontal disease impact diabetes? There has to be um, physiologic methods that we can say, yes, this is the chain of events that happens that causes the outcome. And then causality requires evidence that modification of the risk factor will prevent or moderate the disease. So if we believe that periodontal disease impacts cardiovascular disease or diabetes, if we treat the periodontal disease and eliminate the periodontal disease or control the periodontal disease, because we never eliminate periodontal disease, if we can control the periodontal disease, that should have some impact on the, uh, the systemic medical condition that we're studying. And if it doesn't, then causality is not as likely, simply an association. And associations are not something that we should dismiss because it helps us in our clinical dialogue with our patients to say, gosh, if we know you're more likely to develop cardiovascular disease simply because you have periodontal disease, and it may not be a causation, but it's simply that the other um, behavioral habits that you have will lead that to you, you can advise patients that, hey, I notice you have periodontal disease, and so you're at higher risk for other systemic diseases. So we can use that information, but we wanna be careful about how we apply causality to it and not jump to conclusions. We all know periodontal disease, chronic bacterial infections uh, caused by subgingival dental biofilm, over 700 species in the oral microbiome, second only to the, the digestive tract. And we know that the virulent organisms, particularly the red pathogens, cause tissue destruction, and they also trigger destructive immunopathologic host response. And it's a problem because over 50% of the adult population and nearly 20% 
um, of the adult population have se severe disease. So it's a very, uh, a lot of patients have periodontal disease, obviously. And we know it does affect our, uh, the systemic immune response. We know what the typical pathogens are. And we know that um, it leads to PMN uh, dysfunction as well. It's a chronic inflammatory state, and we know chronic inflammatory states lead to uh, the progression or worsening or causation of other uh, disease processes. And so we fall into that category. And we should be aware of what the inflammatory cytokines are that are, are most harmful. C-reactive protein, interleukins 1 and 6, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and prospaglandin E are the big ones, and they are certainly associated with general inflammation, but also periodontal disease specifically. And we know, again, as we talked about uh, hematogenous spread from that cravicular sulcus into the bloodstream, and that that can be associated with many chronic systemic diseases. We also have to be very aware of biofilm. It's the world that we live in, and we know it's a complex aggregation of microorganisms within a sticky extracellular matrix. It can adhere to the cheeks or any mucosal surface as well as the two surfaces, but also foreign surfaces such as dentures and partial dentures, but catheters um, where patients have urinary tract infections oftentimes from a catheter, but also prosthetic heart valves and prosthetic joints. We know biofilm forms there and then what happens? That can protect very, um, the microorganisms that invade that biofilm are, are protected or are underneath that biofilm. And then our uh, host defenses, antibodies, phagocytes, and, and the antibiotics that we use do not uh, uh, get to those pathogens and, and cannot have an effect on it. We know that biofilm obviously is associated with periodontal disease, but also, as we said, infective endocarditis, coronary artery plaques, prosthetic joint infections, ventilator acquired pneumonia and hospital, ventilator associated pneumonia, hospital acquired pneumonia, as well as AV shunts for dialysis, urinary tracts, and many other infections. So we want to eliminate biofilms or control them wherever we are. And what we don't think about, biofilms actually promote and enable bacterial resistance. And so in this nearly post-antibiotic age, we have to be thinking about how we can eliminate or lessen biofilms because they do promote uh, bacterial resistance and they allow the um, bacterial resistance strains to overgrow. So the question, are there systemic medical conditions which cause or lead to the progression of periodontal disease? Um, there's three areas that we look at diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and obesity. There's not a lot of research uh, and, and not uh, great research related to it, but probably the best is diabetes. And we know there really is a bi-directional relationship. Um, it's estimated that by next year, 640 plus million people worldwide will be diabetic. That's huge. Um, it's a, a, a more than 11% of adults in the United States have diabetes, so they're walking into our offices every day, and we need to understand the relationship. Um, and we know that they're, how well they control their diabetes, as well as how long they've been diabetic, um, is associated with accelerated at attachment loss and progression of periodontal disease. Um, so we know there is a bidirectional relationship. We know diabetics have hyperactive inflammatory responses, and those circulating cytokines that get into the bloodstream get into the, to the obviously the oral cavity and they can cause or lead to more um, tissue destruction um, as well as bone destruction. Um, and that again, it leads to increased levels in, of inflammatory cytokines. Um, but also there's reduced healing for diabetics. There's microangiopathy, um, fibroblast deaths. So we're not going to get as good a connective tissue response when we're doing our periodontal treatment if the patient is a diabetic. And we have to be aware of that when we're predicting and, and trying to decide what's the appropriate treatment for this patient who's a diabetic and also now has uh, periodontal disease. So metabolic syndrome is a cluster of disorders. It's obesity plus two of four other factors, either hypertension, hyperglycemia, low, um, high density lipoproteins or elevated triglycerides. We know if you were diagnosed with metabolic syndrome that you're five times greater risk of developing type two diabetes. Um, and it also predicts a worsening periodontal disease in men from studies. You're 38 to 71% more likely to have periodontal disease if you have metabolic syndrome. 
Um, we know that patients with MEDAS have increased oxidative stress, which can lead to increased inflammation, again, causing um, uh, more cytokines in the bloodstream, which can exacerbate periodontal disease. And we also know that oxidative stress, as well as the medications that patients take for the conditions within metabolic syndrome, leads to decreased salivary flow and uh, xerostomy, and all those things increase our risk of caries, uh, as well as periodontal disease. There was a, a study that was literally just published. I didn't put it in the slides, but I'm, I'm gonna give you a little bit of information about it because it demonstrates a couple of things about evidence-based dentistry and how studies were done. But it was just published in September of this year in the, uh, in the Journal of Clinical Periodontology. And the title was, The Risk of Metabolic Syndrome Onset Was Significantly Higher in Individuals with Periodontitis. It was an eight-year longitudinal study done in Japan and patients who had pockets of six millimeters or greater had a significantly higher risk of MEDS onset and relative risk for um, abdominal obesity and hyperglycemia, two of the four factors that you'd look at um, within metabolic syndrome. And what they said was the relative risk of metabolic syndrome onset, if you were had uh, periodontitis or probing greater than six millimeters in these patients followed over eight years, was 1.30, meaning a 30% greater risk that you would uh, develop uh, metabolic syndrome uh, if you have periodontal disease. And then the relative risk for abdominal obesity was uh, 1.25 or a 25% greater risk. And for hyperglycemia, 1.39, 39% uh, greater risk. It had no impact on dyslipidemia or hypertension, the other two things that we would look at in metabolic syndrome. However, when you looked at the confidence interval, so as I read through the study and I saw that, well, it's pretty significant, a 30% increased risk, but the confidence intervals uh, for abdominal obesity were 1.01 to 1.56 and for hyperglycemia, 1.03 to 1.86. So as I said before, that means it's as low as a 1% chance or as high as an 86% chance of that happening. I don't put a lot of faith in that, but simply knowing again, your patients, that that information is not unuseful, however, um, because if you have periodontal disease, you can say the odds are higher that you're going to um, have a greater likelihood of obesity and hyperglycemia. Those are just good, that's good information to know and to share with your patients. So when we look at studies and you see the headline, it's significantly higher. Um, well, maybe not so if you dig deeper into the study. And that's why we should uh, understand evidence-based dentistry methodology when we read these studies. When we look at obesity, there are associations as kind of just uh, noted in that last uh, study, uh, but no causation. We know that just adipose tissue itself releases cytokines, particularly tumor necrosis uh, factor alpha and interleukin-6, and that those horm other hormones contribute to periodontal disease or tissue destruction. Um, and we know that um, just the inflammation from obes obesity can deregulate the body's immune system. And again, all that impaired immune system can have an effect on um, the periodontal disease progression. So I'll try and give you, and I think you'll have available to you a take home message or what do we share with our patients or what should we know about these things? And simply related to systemic medical conditions affecting periodontitis, that diabetes, obesity, and metabolic syndrome all are associated with increased risk or worsening of periodontal disease. So when we do our health histories or we simply examine our patients, just that knowledge alone tells us, okay, red flag, this is a greater risk um, and we need to evaluate better. Type two diabetes and periodontal disease is a bi-directional relationship and all of these involve inflammation. Um, obviously that's important with periodontal disease. So this is where we'll spend um, the rest of our time here. Does periodontal disease or periapical pathology, just periodontal disease, cause or lead to the progression or worsening of systemic medical conditions? So we'll go through um, these uh, different areas and some have more research than others. And again, we'll give you a take home message with them and then we'll wrap up with how do we put this into clinical practice, all this information. And I, I apologize that it's a lot of studies and it's a lot of information. Um, uh, you, this will be available to you 
don't try and take notes, just kind of um, get the general overview. Um, but it's important, as I say, if we're going to be evidence-based, we have to look at the evidence and see what it is and kind of understand the study. So I'm going to give you a lot of studies. I know that's a little boring, but we'll get to the bottom line and how we impact that clinically as well. Um, there were recent studies done about the periodontal disease and the risk of mortality, and these just have come out in the last two years. Um, this first one was done in the Journal of Dental Research, um, uh, Periodontitis Edentialism and Risk of Mortality, a Systematic Review. They looked at 57 studies um, with nearly 6 million participants, so a huge cohort. Um, it's the first systematic review. And what they found was chronic inflammation or infection from periodontal disease, and then obviously tooth loss leading to edentialism was associated with increased risk of all-cause mortality, anywhere from 47% to twice as likely to die of any particular cause if you simply had periodontal disease versus patients who did not have periodontal disease. Um, another study that was just recently published look at oral health and mortality among order, older adults. And this was um, uh, data studied from patients who were evaluated between 1988 and 94 in an NHANES study and then followed them through December of 2015. And it was nearly 5,000 patients, um, all that were over the age of 60 at the, uh, of the study. Uh, over 4,000 of them died. And then they assessed them for um, edentialism, periodontitis, unrelated or untreated dental caries, and self rated oral health. Um, and then they followed their all cause mortality over the 27 year period until 2015. Um, and they did do adjustments for their socio demographic and behavioral variables, smoking, um, what was their um, uh, zip code to see you know, how affluent they were, those types of things. And they found that the presence of untreated dental caries, severe periodontitis, and edentialism was significantly rated to higher risk of all-cause mortality, same as the previous study. Interestingly, of those patients who were edentulous and lost all their teeth um, that uh, uh, did not wear dentures had a higher mortality risk, um, but patients who wore dentures or had some replacement of their teeth um, did not have a higher mortality risk. So the inflammatory process and the ability to function and eat certainly does impact uh, mortality. And that's our take home message to patients. What do we tell patients about that? That poor oral health is a chronic inflammatory disorder and it impacts our overall health and has been shown to be associated with a higher risk of death. And that pathogenic or bad bacteria from the mouth can enter the bloodstream and it can affect other areas of our body and worsen other systemic medical conditions. Poor oral health um, uh, leads to a decrease in quality of life, discomfort, pain, inability to eat, um, and an increase in the risk of an earlier death, potentially. And that a healthy mouth is a healthier body and may actually increase your lifespan. I think those are all great messages for us as a profession to be able to deliver to our patients. And we have the evidence to actually back it up. We'll do a little review of COVID-19. Thankfully, um, though it's not uh, obviously as bad as it was, but it will be here forever. So we should be kind of aware of, of what the SARS-CoV virus um, uh, does and how it impacts oral health. We know that the ACE2 receptor sites where the SARS-CoV-2 virus attaches to the body has a high prevalence in the tongue, the salivary glands, the buccal mucosa, and the tonsils. So the mouth is highly infected when patients um, uh, get COVID-19. <clears throat> we know it can lead to gingival inflammation. And again, elevated cytokines and interleukins um, uh, due to the inflammatory response and immune response when we're infected by any virus. Uh, and we know it actually we can find the virus in a carious tooth within the cavity itself, and we can find it in the periodontal pocket. Um, we know it leads to dry mouth because it impacts the salivary glands, but also just simply when we were wearing masks during COVID, um, obviously we saw a lot more dry mouths, ourselves included, but our patients as well. Can lead to oral ulcerations due to tissue necrosis because of the oxygen deprivation when the virus overtakes the cell. And I called it the COVID clench. Um, we as healthcare providers certainly did it, but our patients too. I don't think that stress is necessarily going away, um, but we know um, mask use, sleep deprivation, uh, or uh, uh, all those things uh, can lead to cracked teeth. And I certainly have seen that in my private practice as well. 
And obviously we know the loss of taste and smell. We uh, Multiple cranial nerves are impacted and infected with the virus, but uh, affecting neural transmission, but also that the virus is found in the tongue and in the salivary glands, the minor salivary glands that inhabit the tongue and the cheeks and the mouth. So um, thankfully for most people that goes away, but if there is neural damage, um, it may be long lasting and impactful, but uh, if it's just local factors, um, not as much. There was some research done during COVID about how periodontitis uh, may affect COVID-19. And this was a meta-analysis published in the Journal of Dental Research in June of 2022. And they showed that there was a uh, non-statistically significant tendency for an increased risk of SARS-CoV-2 infection in subjects with periodontitis. So we did see more infection in patients with periodontitis, but it wasn't statistically significant. But interestingly, and I'll show you a study later, um, the epithelial cells in the mouth actually produce what's called an uh, interferon lambda, and that has the ability to stop viral infections. And patients who have periodontitis, actually that interferon lambda um, is no longer active. And so it may, patients with periodontitis may be more susceptible to viral infections in general. And that's a, a very interesting study we'll cover at the end. Um, again, what they showed in this meta-analysis, periodontitis patients were more likely to experience a more severe course of COVID-19. Um, four times more likely to require hospitalizations if you had periodontal disease versus not. Six times more likely to require um, assisted ventilation or have to be intubated and seven times more likely to die of COVID complications if you had periodontitis. And interestingly, there was a study that, that showed patients with periodontitis have circulating cytokines and PMNs in their bloodstream. And when uh, you have another infection that now comes into the body and particularly COVID-19, that these PMNs are shown to be primed for attack, that they're ready to go um, because of uh, their association with periodontal disease. And when another disease or another virus um, enters the body, that these PMNs that are already circulating in the bloodstream because of periodontal disease um, actually uh, are lead to cytokine storms. And that is part of the big problem with patients who had COVID-19. And, and many of them died due to obviously the virus overtaking so many of their organ systems, but many as well died of cytokine storm. And could that be partly the biologic plausibility of why periodontal disease is associated with worse outcomes if you have uh, COVID. There are other, you can look for tongue ulcerations and other changes with tissue that you might see in periodontal or in patients that come present with COVID-19 um, that you wouldn't expect to see in otherwise healthy patients, things to look for as well. So the take home message related to COVID-19, um, uh, the virus that causes COVID-19 can be found in the plaque on teeth, the gums, the cheeks, salivary glands, and taste buds, meaning good oral health and good rinses and eliminating that biofilm is important to potentially lessen your risk of, of worse outcomes um, if you're infected. COVID-19 infection can cause mouth sores, a dry mouth, and alterations in taste and smell. And then patients with periodontitis who become infected with COVID-19 are at a higher risk for hospitalization, ICU admission, need for a ventilator and death. And so that's what we wanna share with our patients related to COVID-19 or be aware of ourself. Um, cardiovascular disease is, is what we'll cover next. And there's a lot of information related to this um, with heart attacks, atherosclerosis, hypertension, AFib, and infective endocarditis, I'll add as well. Um, how might periodontal disease potentially impact cardiovascular disease? Three different models that you might look at. The common susceptible, susceptibility model means that we're genetically determined phenotype as an individual patient, which leads to a greater risk of atherosclerosis and infection, and that periodontal disease doesn't uh, cause the atherosclerosis. It's just our own genetics that does, and the periodontal disease is insignificant. Then the systemic inflammation model, as we talked about with periodontal disease, you have increased cir circulating cytokines, which damage the vascular endothelium and result in atherosclerosis, which can lead to cardiovascular disease. And then the infection model, um, a direct infection of the blood vessels by bacteria 
in the atherosclerotic plaque. So we know P. gingivalis um, uh, by a study by Ford is found in 100% of atherosclerotic plaques in patients who have periodontal disease. So we know it gets there and it may actually be an infection or it might be an inflammation model. Inflammation is strongly associated with cardiovascular disease. And in one study over 400, of, of over 400 patients with defined cardiovascular disease, the highest levels of C-reactive protein were seen in those with the most advanced periodontal disease. So there was a correlation, and that's part of the Bradford Hill quality metrics when you're trying to go to causality. If there is greater periodontal disease, do you see greater cardiovascular disease? And in this case, um, you do see, see that in this particular study. Also, though, chronic in inflammation um, uh, increases macrophage secretion of specific cytokines, cytokines that are necessary to actually allow myofibroblast activation, which leads to repair after a patient's had a heart attack. So um, chronic inflammatory process like periodontal disease inhibits those myofibroblast uh, activation, and you may not have as good a healing after you've had a heart attack. So the, the study's authors impaired cardiac wound healing, increased risk of mortality and heart failure for patients with chronic inflammatory diseases, and obviously periodontal disease is one. We know inflammation impairs the function of the endothelium, the inner lining of the blood vessels of the heart. It also promotes atheroma formation in the arteries, so there's plaque buildups that are there. And we know it also compromises the integrity of those plaques, which can lead to emboli breaking loose or clots breaking loose and going to the heart causing a heart attack or the brain causing a stroke or potentially a pulmonary embolus. And then we think about statistics. Nearly half of all cardiovascular events occur in subjects who do not have traditional high, um, risk factors, such as high cholesterol, low high density, low uh, um, lipoproteins. So could inflammation play a role in that other 50% of cardiovascular patients who don't have the traditional risk factors? And very likely it does. So we'll look at atherosclerosis and specifically P. gingivalis because that's been the most studied bug and, and is probably one of the, we know one of the greatest pathogens in periodontal disease, but also uh, found in so many other systemic diseases. Um, P. gingivalis, the most abundant species detected in coronary and femoral arteries, and it's viable. Viable P. gingivalis and AA um, living in these atherosclerotic plaques. And again, from that Ford study, P. gingivalis cultured from 100% of healthy arterial walls. And we know bacteria can invade our arterial walls when it's in the bloodstream, but P. gingivalis accounted for nearly 80% of all bacterial species. So it either has the ability to block other species from invading the arterial walls, or it just is the most pathogenic and ha is the, has the best ability to be viable and live in, in uh, those walls. So we know um, that P. gingivalis uh, resides in um, uh, diseased atherosclerotic tissue, uh, the walls of aneurysms within vessels, um, and that actually in pigs, you can induce atherosclerosis following bacteremia with P. gingivalis, even though those pigs' uh, cholesterol levels are kept low. So again, an animal study, but we actually can induce atherosclerosis um, in animals simply by using P. gingivalis or in introducing P. gingivalis bacteremias. P. gingivalis has unique properties to be able to invade the arterial wall and to survive there, and as well to be able to escape the immune system. But we don't know whether the colonization occurs prior to the atherosclerosis disease onset, or whether the disease tissues themselves form and then enable subsequent colonization. So it could be both, um, but it may be associated with the initiation or the exacerbation of atherosclerosis without any causation. But we know for a fact it's there and we'd certainly rather it, it be not be there. So um, from atherosclerosis to actual myocardial infarction, and there are a number of studies looking at myocardial infarction and periodontal disease. <clears throat> in this study done in Poland, uh, myocardial infarction incidence correlates with the number of pockets greater than four millimeters, bleeding on probing sites, 
and severity of tooth loss, even after you adjustment for, uh, for all the known cardiovascular risk factors, and that they can find P. gingivalis anti uh, antibodies are elevated in the patients who had heart attacks. So this study looked at patients with bleeding on probing, severe periodontal disease, and clinical attachment loss, and then look at the results. Patients with bleeding on probing greater than 50% had a four times higher odds of having had a past uh, heart attack. Patients with severe periodontal disease are three times higher odds of a past heart attack. Patients with clinical attachment loss greater than six millimeters, only a 20% higher odds of having a past heart attack. And think about it, doesn't that make sense? Inflammation leads to bleeding on probing. Um, so that had the highest odds of a past heart attack. And then severe periodontal disease, um, which likely still has uh, obviously bone loss, but likely still has an inflammatory process and likely uncontrolled, um, the next highest odds. Clinical attachment loss can be evidence of periodontal disease, but think about how you measure it. From where the cemento enamel junction is, from the CEJ to the depth of the pocket, if you have a two millimeter pocket, perfect periodontal health, but four millimeters of recession, your uh, clinical attachment loss is six millimeters, but that's a perfectly healthy scenario. So when you look at a study and you say, does the, does the results make sense with the biologic plausibility? When I look at this study, it certainly does. And their conclusions were an association was found between chronic periodontal disease and a past history of a, a heart attack. Multiple other studies have shown correlations as well. Shai did a study in 2017 uh, looked at over a, a meta-analysis of 22 studies of nearly 130,000 patients. Patients with periodontal disease had an increased risk of having a heart attack, um, nearly twice as likely, again, with a 59% to 2.5 times more likely. Two pulled 25 different studies on the treatment of periodontitis um, and demonstrated intervention of periodontitis. Uh, periodontal disease improved atherosclerotic lipid profiles, but no direct evidence of a reduction in risk of cardiovascular disease. And as we talked about association versus causality, this study showed patients who had periodontal treatment did not show um, a, a reduction in their risk of having a future cardiovascular event. So um, that really um, goes to the causality. Oki had a, a study and they showed actually three species of periodontal um, bacteria present in the thrombi of patients who had an acute myocardial infarction. And so what they did, they would go in, they would break open the blood vessel, remove the clot, and then they try and culture bacteria out of the clots. And so patients who were having a heart attack at the time, and they went in and took those clots out and they found periodontal pathogens in the clot. We know P. gingivalis we were, are some of those bacteria. We know that they induce platelet aggregation. Could they have been the reason that that clot actually broke loose and was there? We don't know. It may just simply be that the body's um, uh, immune system is doing its job. It's picking up the P. gingivalis or the other periodontal bugs out of the bloodstream, and they're on their way to be eliminated. And they got caught in this clot and were there. So we don't know what it means and we shouldn't jump to conclusions, um, but we should be aware that they're there. When we talk with patients, I certainly say, we can find the bugs that are in your mouth in a clot that causes a heart attack or a stroke. And we know we don't know for sure what that means, but we sure know we'd rather not have them there. Let's get a cleaner, healthier mouth. Let's reduce the likelihood that those bacteria will get into the bloodstream. And likely we're gonna have a healthier body in relationship to that. And then finally, Holman did a study in 2017 with over 5,000 patients with periodontal disease that were treated in the same clinic by calibrated instructors, and then they followed them longitudinally for 17 years. Those who did not respond as well to periodontal treatment had a higher risk of a future cardiovascular um, disease event than those who responded to the periodontal treatment. So a little bit of conflict with the two study, uh, but again, certainly um, is, is some evidence that periodontal treatment did have a positive impact on your future likelihood of uh, periodontal treatment. And I just saw it come up, explain meta-analysis, please. And, and I, 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 a meta-analysis means they have taken multiple studies that individual studies that were done, in this case in Shai, 
It was 22 separate studies. They combined them all. They looked at the results of all of those and did statistical analysis to say, how do we take all these combined studies and come to conclusions that would be generalizable from all those individual studies that may not have uh, as much power to be able to, to do that. So um, that is very high, um, right below um, systematic reviews, then meta-analysis, and then clinical uh, practice guidelines in the evidence pyramid. Ryden did a study and looked at periodontal disease and a first MI risk. Um, and they, uh, uh, he found that risk for MI was significantly increased among subjects with periodontitis, nearly a 50% greater risk, uh, odds ratio 1.49, and from a 21% to 83% when you look at the confidence interval. So it wasn't zero, it was significant. After adjustment for confounders of diabetes, smoking, education, and marital status, there still was a positive association, but much less, 28% more likely to have a first risk of a, a heart attack if you had periodontal disease, but here it goes from 3% to 60%. <clears throat> so that's still a good take home mes message. And this was a very well done study. It was a, a very large study. Um, and their conclusions were periodontitis could be looked on as a risk factor of first time MI independent of other risk factors. So they would say, um, you know, cholesterol, obesity, smoking, all the traditional risk factors they would include periodontal disease potentially as an independent risk factor. But remember, this is an observational study only. So what does Cochrane say? And they did do a review of all these studies up through October of 2022. And they say there is insufficient evidence to support or refute that periodontal therapy can prevent the recurrence of cardiovascular disease in patients with chronic periodontal disease. So there's mixed results. We can't say for sure that periodontal disease will impact cardiovascular disease, but we know that improving periodontal disease status it does improve, as it's found, um, atherosclerotic uh, markers, and endo it does improve endothelial function. These are surrogate uh, markers for cardiovascular disease, and we need further trials. But if we can improve someone's uh, endothelium and their reduced atherosclerotic plaques and the likely risk of uh, thrombatic events from those plaques, that's a very good thing, um, and we should do so. Some of you may be aware of uh, Bale and Donine. Brad Bale um, is a cardiologist, and Amy Donine is a nurse practitioner with a doctorate. Um, and their uh, method of treating cardiovascular disease is all predicated around inflammation. And they look at the amount of lipid in arterial plaque as predicting the risk of a heart attack or stroke. And so they don't look and say, well, you got 80% blockage in your arteries. They don't care about that old sclerotic plaque that they're, they're looking at um, the young plaque that's much more dangerous in their opinion. And would a, a heart catheterization would not discover that you need ultrasound to detect that. And what they say is it is mandatory to incorporate oral health into any uh, cardiovascular prevention program. The bail domain method could not guarantee arterial wellness without excellent oral health care providers being involved. Snuffing, ar snuffing arterial inflammation is the keystone of the bail domain method, and that requires excellent oral health. So this is out there, and there are great disciples of it, and certainly um, I think there are a lot of risk factors. I do believe reducing inflammation certainly is helpful to reduce reducing risk for cardiovascular disease. Um, I saw this in, in uh, uh, continuing education, and here it is, uh, a hygienist who works um, out of the office of a cardiologist, and they collaborating to reduce oral systemic inflammation. On a good day, we save a smile. On a great day, we save a life. I wouldn't quite go that far, but certainly we are making people healthier, um, to be sure. So this um, was a study done in the Journal of Dental Research, just published last year. Um, on the oral condition, just overall oral condition and incident coronary heart disease. And what they did was took three groups of patients um, and they looked at their oral conditions, those who were in optimal oral health and they were able to eat any food that they wanted. And then those who were in moderate oral health and they had some impaired um, ability to eat, they had some tooth loss or mobility on teeth um, and weren't able to eat as well. And then they looked at a cohort of patients who had very poor oral health 
and they had um, uh, so many missing teeth that their their ability to eat was severely compromised. They looked at over 5,000 patients <clears throat> uh, over a four-year period, and they evaluated them um, every two years. As compared with the healthy group, cluster one, the risk of uh, coronary heart disease progressively increased um, from cluster two to cluster three, and literally from a 45% greater likelihood if you had some impact on your ability to eat and chew um, to a two and a half times greater risk of coronary heart disease if you were severely impaired in your ability to eat. So their conclusion was middle-aged individuals with poor health and severely impaired uh, masticatory capacity have more than twice the risk of incident coronary heart disease than those with optimal oral, oral health. What do we do with that message? One, we inform our patients why it's very important for them to restore their mouths to a healthy status and to restore their dentitions to be able to eat properly. We also can use that message with our um, uh, patient or with our public policy makers and our insurance carriers to say, Here's why we need to make sure that oral health is a covered expense um, in public health programs as well as in medical insurance because we have an impact on the ability to potentially prevent um, other disease processes. So that information alone is worth sharing with your patients, but also beyond that. Now we'll look at um, AFib, which we just see more and more patients diagnosed with. Certainly age is a factor in AFib, um, but could periodontitis be as well? And so this study looked at the relationship between periodontitis and atrial, atrial fibrosis in atrial fibrillation. And, and it was a small group, but this was a, a, a very well done study. They had 76 patients who had AFib and they were going to undergo cardiac surgery to remove what's called the left atrial appendage. And um, they did periodontal disease or exams on um, each of these patients, 76 patients, three days prior to their surgery. Those with periodontitis were much more likely to have atrial fibrosis after multivariable adjustment. And we know atrial fibrosis can lead to the onset and persistence of AFib. Um, they also found that atrial uh, thrombi were more present in patients who had periodontal disease when they did this surgery. That can lead to an increased risk of stroke. So inflammatory mediators from the teeth could cause atrial fibrosis or the immune response to those inflammatory mediators, which could lead to increased fibroblast activity and lead to, lead to these appendages and fibroses. Um, so um, what they uh, recommend is we need studies to see if treating periodontal disease could reduce atrial fibrosis and then uh, also reduce AFib. Um, and thus, we could see this is a modifiable risk factor. So again, more and more research linking periodontitis to different cardiac conditions. And, and we'll finally look at heart failure and then infective endocarditis. Um, this study looked at, uh, in the Journal of American uh, uh, cardiology, periodontal status, and C-reactive protein in incident heart failure. Chronic systemic inflammation is commonly observed in patients with heart failure and is believed to be directly related to the progression of heart failure. We know periodontal disease is a chronic inflammatory disease process. So they looked at over 7,000 patients who had had periodontal exams between 1990 and 1998 in the ERIC uh, study, and they followed them for 13 years. Those who ended up edentulous had nearly twice the risk of heart failure than those who retained their teeth. And this was after significant adjustment. So um, what they also found is heart failure, and why is this important? Heart failure patients incur an average of nearly $30,000 a year in annual healthcare costs versus those patients who don't have heart failure. So it's a huge, huge impact to our medical costs. And if we can potentially, by simply eliminating periodontal disease, maybe lessen the risk for heart failure progression or heart failure development, um, wouldn't we be doing a great service to our patients and saving a huge burden? Um, this was another study that just came out literally a couple months ago, looking at over 170,000 patients with type two diabetes and over, um, uh, over the age of 40 years, 
and they studied it from 2008 to 2017. What they found was an increased number of missing teeth was associated with a higher risk of heart failure in patients who had periodontal disease. And that you could modify it, you could actually decrease the risk of heart failure if that patient had one or more cleanings per year and or for those patients who brush, simply brush their teeth two times or more daily. So the combined presence of periodontal disease, dental caries, and missing teeth increase your risk for heart failure in patients who are diabetic. But if you had good oral hygiene, um, a home care, as well as good professional care, you could actually reduce your risk of heart failure. So here's a, a study that looked at some treatment options, whether self-treatment um, uh, by just brushing your teeth or dental cleanings and found a reduction in the rates of heart failure. So dental disease management and good oral care may prevent heart failure in patients with type two diabetes. Again, just awareness about that is a great message to um, give to our patients. And then finally, this was a study that was just released. We know infective endocarditis is a world that we live in in patients who particularly at high risk, those with heart valve replacements, those with a previous history of infective endocarditis, those patients who've had a congenital heart disease with some sort of repair are the highest risk. And we use pre-medication for those patients um, when we have bacteremia as, as a result of dental treatment to try and reduce um, their risk of infective endocarditis. But we've never had studies done to look at oral hygiene as a risk factor for infective endocarditis. It's only been oral procedures um, uh, related to that. And this study was done by Peter Lockhart and it was just published in March of this year online. I think it's in print in Triple O, one of our journals. And they looked, um, it, it was a study over years um, because infective endocarditis actually is pretty rare. We don't see it very often, but they took patients who were admitted to the hospital and if they agreed by consent, to have a dental exam um, within 24 hours of their admission for a diagnosis of infective endocarditis. And then they did a dental exam to see what was their periodontal status, what was their oral health status, what was their calculus index and their gingival index. And they had 62 patients that agreed to do that and then ultimately had a dental exam. They compared those as with outpatients who had the same cardiovascular disease risk factors but did not develop infective endocarditis. So that was the control. The case patients, those who developed infective endocarditis had a 53% greater dental calculus index and a 26% greater dental plaque index than the control group who did not develop um, infective endocarditis. The patients who developed infective endocarditis had fewer dentists and dental hygiene visits um, uh, overall and fewer within the 12 weeks prior to develop the infective endocarditis um, and more, were more likely to have never seen a dentist. So they had poor oral health. Um, they found common oral bacteria identified in the blood cultures of 44% of the infective endocarditis cases. And that makes sense because infective endocarditis, again, falls 35 to 55% of patients are related to group Viridans uh, strep. So their conclusions were poor oral hygiene should be considered a risk factor for infective endocarditis and improving oral hygiene should be encouraged for patients at risk for infective endocarditis. So a lot of take home messages related to a lot of different areas of cardiovascular disease and oral health. And, and this is just simply one of, the, one of the latest. So there's our take home message for patients with <clears throat> cardiovascular disease. Again, we know that the bad bugs get into the bloodstream and they can be found in the walls of blood vessels, coronary artery plaques, heart muscle, and heart valves. They're attracted to areas of chronic inflammation and that is diseased atherosclerotic plaques is an inflammatory process in itself. And so it attracts P. gingivalis to it. Oral bacteria can be found in the blood clots that cause heart attacks and strokes. We don't know what that means, but I sure don't want to, as a patient, know that the bugs from the mouth are in those. Um, and again, bacteria associated with periodontal disease and abscessed teeth can cause damage to blood vessels, leading to atherosclerosis, increased risk of AFib, heart attacks, and congestive heart failure. And then I always explain to patients um, about nitroglycerin. I think almost everyone knows someone who's had chest pain before in their life. And what do they do when they have chest pain? They don't swallow a pill. Um, they, they 
uh, take a pill and they nitroglycerin, which is a vasodilator, and they put it under their tongue. And within literally a minute to two minutes, their chest pain, if the nitroglycerin works for them, is going to go away. So that is a great lesson to say to patients, all that schmutz that's on your teeth, all that calculus, that plaque, the food that you've left there, all of that is being absorbed through the floor of your mouth. And we know it gets to the heart. And we know it gets to other areas of the body. And just think about what that means. And we know what some of the data is related to cardiovascular disease. So that's a simple analogy that I use with patients because they just think it's isolated to the mouth and, and has no impact anywhere else. So we'll move on to stroke um, patients, which is tightly um, linked to cardiovascular disease. And this was a study uh, by SAN at the University of South Carolina published in 2018. And they looked at, at pa healthy patients and then patients with six varying levels of periodontal disease from mild perio to severe perio and everything in between. And what they found was <clears throat> and generally almost a twice as high likelihood of having a stroke if you had periodontal disease. And you can see those odds ratios um, a 1.861 uh, being healthy and then up to 2.2 times uh, greater. And if you look at the confidence intervals and the reason I put them there, none are near zero. The lowest is 16% greater increased risk of stroke, but up to almost four times greater. So very significant. High gingival inflammation in the absence of severe periodontal disease and the highly inflamed severe periodontal disease are the higher risk than uh, of a stroke than those with mild, moderate, or posterior disease patterns. Those were the patterns they saw, and that makes sense. It emphasized the importance of inflammation rather than just the level of attachment or bone loss that's occurred because those patients may be very stable. Um, and then interestingly, compared to a reference group of episodic dental care users, regular dental care users had a lower risk of ischemic uh, stroke, meaning that a clot went and cut off the blood supply. The hazard ratio being 0.77, meaning a 23% lower risk of having a stroke um, if you were received regular and routine dental care than those who only uh, sought dental care episodically. So this tells us again that we want to um, eliminate periodontal disease or control it as best we can, and we and we should but we have to pay attention to inflammation as well. So uh, risk of cardioembolic and thrombotic strokes, 2.2 to 2.6 times higher. Um, and, and SEN's conclusions were periodontal disease it is an independent risk factor for ischemic stroke. There was a um, population-based study in Taiwan that, that was similar to what that other study uh, uh, found about cleanings. And they found that cleanings or periodontal treatment could reduce the incidence of ischemic stroke. Um, and, and so we haven't duplicated those studies in the United States, but randomized controlled trials have established that periodontal treatments imp improve systemic inflammation, lipid profile, hypertension, and endothelial dis dysfunction. Um, and uh, all of those things are surrogate markers, but they're very critical to um, stroke. Um, and so likely they are modifiable risk factors and may impact uh, stroke. This was an interesting study um, that was done in the Journal of the American Heart Association in May of 2019. And they looked at 75 patients who were treated for ischemic stroke. They went into the brain, they took the clot out that caused the stroke, and they found 59 of those clots contained a strain of strep commonly found in the mouth. Um, so uh, their conclusions were it may contribute to thrombotic events and progression of cerebrovascular diseases. Um, Peter Lockhart, um, uh, who's probably one of the world's authorities on distant site infections and oral bacteremias and what their impact are on other areas of the body, says the significance of the finding is open to question. Finding evidence of bacteria in blood clots doesn't mean they have a role in the disease process. And I think we should um, be, you know, take that to heart um, and not jump to conclusions about what does that data mean. But as I say, um, patients, uh, uh, I think, are, are sometimes incredulous that you can find the bacteria from the mouth directly in a blood clot that causes a stroke. This was, again, a systematic review and meta-analysis, uh, uh, looking at a multitude of studies 
related to periodontitis as a risk factor for stroke done in November 2019. So you looked at seven case control studies and three cohort studies, 10 studies uh, in general, and they combined the results of all of those in a meta-analysis. It suggests an increased risk of stroke in patients with periodontal disease, strong association between both diseases. Obviously, the SEND study was part of this. And again, uh, on average, a two times increased risk of, of stroke, but we need to evaluate the, the uh, results with caution. But equally as important, even if you're not at higher risk from stroke, if you have periodontal disease, for patients who have stroke and then need follow-up care, oral care is extremely important because those patients are more dysphagic. They have a harder time swallowing, um, they have a harder time eating, and they have a much higher likelihood of aspirating um, saliva into their respiratory tract, and we'll cover that under pneumonia, but they're at much greater risk of pneumonia. So even if you don't take the information related to stroke uh, of being at higher risk if you have periodontitis, um, for your patients who have had strokes, it's critically important that they maintain good oral hygiene and they good good regular oral care to make sure that they don't have a dysbiotic relationship in their mouth that can lead them to more respiratory pathogens in the mouth that can lead them to greater risk of pneumonias. So um, cerebral abscesses and oral bacteria, this was an interesting study um, just published in January of this year, and it was done in the United Kingdom. And they looked at data from 87 patients admitted with a brain abscess over a 16 year period. We don't see a lot of brain abscesses, so it's a long um, uh, period of time to have to evaluate to get enough uh, patients to actually have confidence in the results but they could uh, culture oral bacteria from 29 of 52 cases where no source of infection was identified. And in the 52 cases, or in the remaining cases where they did identify uh, a source of the infection, even in those 35 cases, uh, they could, eight of them uh, identified oral bacteria. So we know that bacteria from the mouth and particularly P. gingivalis uh, F. nucleatum and AA, um, either the bacteria themselves or their virulence factors and um, uh, endotoxins get into the brain. We know that P. gingivalis uh, actually can, and, and the gingipanes, the virulence factors that they produce, literally re, um, reduce or increase blood brain permeability and reduce the blood brain barrier. Um, so uh, the there are biologic plausibility of why this can occur. And um, for if you're working in a hospital setting, which I do, um, having close contact with, with uh, uh, your um, neuro neurologists and um, uh, those who neurosurgeons, as well as infectious diseases to say, hey, um, make sure we look at the mouth as a potential source. If you haven't identified a source, or even if you have, there may be oral bacteria there. So oral cavity could be considered as a source of occult infection in case of brain abscesses. And I can tell you from personal experience, just this summer in July, I had a patient, um, 60 years old, who has a failing dentition. We're trying to keep him out of dentures. We've done root canals in some cases. We're patching and repairing. He has absolutely no, we're just trying to get him along. Um, he has no acute um, uh, infections, no pain, no chronic perilous or any other symptoms um, in his oral cavity. And he was diagnosed with a brain abscess after a multitude of, of testing. They couldn't find what was wrong and finally found out um, that he had a brain abscess. And they cultured microaerophilic bacteria, which certainly some of the strep bacteria in the mouth are those. And I got him in after he got out of the hospital. We did a full mouth series. Sure enough, he and he had uh, three or potentially four areas of chronic periapical radiolucencies that were totally asymptomatic and may or may not have been the cause of his brain abscess. He still has aphasia, he's had a pretty good recovery, but he had a secondary recurrence as we're now staging him to um, go to dentures uh, and hopefully implant supported dentures. So um, it impacted my personal practice and there's no way to say it's 100% it's causative. Uh, but when I saw those periapical radiolucencies, my, my heart just dropped because, um, uh, and, and not that we did anything wrong, um, but simply that uh, I didn't think of it as much of a risk factor. And, and even though rare, it's obviously um, a bad outcome for a patient when that ha happens. So what's our take home message for um, uh, stroke? 
Uh, pathogenic bacteria, again, from the mouth can enter the bloodstream. It can be found in the brain, increasing the risk of brain abscess and stroke. Oral bacteria can be found in the blood clots and cause strokes. Periodontal pathogens can, can cause increased blood-brain barrier permeability and possibly increase the risk of brain abscess. And then, as importantly, patients who've had a stroke often have difficulty swallowing and are at higher risk of aspirating saliva and oral bacteria into the lungs and increased risk of pneumonia. So we'll look at diabetes where there is definitely a bi-directional relationship. And there is um, obviously a big concern because um, we know the data and the CDC update in, in January of 2022, simply from 2020, saw an increase of 3 million uh, additional patients who are diagnosed diabetic, again, over 11% of the US population. And then another 96 million people who are, um, have pre-diabetes, only 20% of them that are aware they have pre-diabetes and are at much greater risk of diabetes. And so um, uh, we know it is a bi-directional relationship. Patients with periodontitis exhibit a higher chance of developing pre-diabetes and diabetes, and patients with type 2 diabetes have an increased risk of developing periodontitis. How is that interplay? How does periodontal disease affect diabetes? We know that any infection, chronic inflammation and infections reduce the uptake of gl glucose in the cells. That means it stays in the bloodstream. It can't get to the cell to do the job it needs to do. We also know that endotoxin and inflammatory mediators reduce the efficiency of insulin. So even if it does get into the cell, it doesn't work as well. Um, and, and we know that there's a lot of cytokines that are released during um, uh, if you have periodontal disease and they're in the bloodstream, affecting the efficiency and uptake of in, uh, glucose uh, or, or in, insulin uh, into the cells. And then how might diabetes affect periodontal disease? Diabetics, generally have a hyperinflammatory response. So that means that they have circulating cytokines just simply from diabetes itself. That gets into the mouse and it leads to more tissue and bone destruction. Also microangiopathy and poor healing, less blood flow to the periodontal structures and poor healing and fibroblast function means that even when we do our treatment, they may not respond as well um, because they're, they're not gonna heal as well due to the fibroblast um, uh, impairment and PMN impairment as well. <clears throat> There's also strong evidence for an association between periodontitis and glycemic status in people who are not diabetic. So that means it's harder to control your glycemic status if you have periodontitis, even if you're not diabetic. Why might that be important? We're learning now uh, patients with prosthetic joint infections or who have prosthetic joints uh, uh, placed and patients who have other surgeries and where a biofilm forms, if you're, uh, even though you're not a diabetic and you have a prosthetic joint placed, biofilm forms almost immediately, uh, and your uh, blood glucose is out of range, 80 to 120 at the time of your surgery, you're at higher risk for a prosthetic joint infection in the future, even though you're not diabetic. So it is important clinically to some of the things that we, uh, that we see our patients have and we as ourselves as patients. Um, and then periodontitis is significantly associated with poor glycemic uh, control in diabetics themselves, but it's not associated with type 1 diabetics, only type 2 diabetics. And that makes sense biologically, right? Type 1 diabetics simply do stop producing insulin. It isn't about how the insulin gets into the cells and whether the glucose is, is left in the bloodstream or not. Um, they just simply don't produce insulin. So again, it makes sense that it would be with type 2 diabetics um, periodontitis association and not type one. Diabetics we know have greater complications, retinopathies, renal complications, foot ulcerations, and cardiovascular complications than do non-diabetic patients. In all cases, patients with periodontal disease had worse um, uh, complications than those patients who didn't have diabetes. So the microvascular complications are far greater impacted if you have periodontitis than if you don't in patients who are uh, diabetic. This was a randomized controlled trial um, uh, done in Spain, and they looked at 90 patients, and they had two groups, a patient who received treatment, 
meaning oral hygiene instruction and scaling and root planning, and the contro controlled group who had subject or super gingival scaling only. There was a significant reduction in the HbA1c by uh, a half a percentage point, as well as fasting blood glucose seen in the patients who were treated with scaling root and root planning at three months and six months follow-up. But the metabolic control was unchanged in the non-treatment group. Um, and in any of those patients that didn't show metabolic control improvement with the scaling and root plating, they all had significantly higher BMI. So they were patients who were obese. Obese patients who were treated with scaling and root plating um, uh, did not show improvement in their metabolic control just due to the scaling and root plating. That makes sense because obesity itself is a chronic inflammatory process. Um, and we need to control both to get the best results. How is this significant? We know a clinical um, or a reduction of 1% reduction of, of HbA1c is associated with a 21% reduction in deaths related to diabetes and a 14% reduction in MI and a 37% reduction in microvascular complications. So simply getting their periodontal health um, uh, and improving their HbA1c um, by half a percentage point could re result in, in, in nearly a 10% reduction in deaths related to diabetes. That's pretty impactful in my opinion. Another study by Diato um, uh, again looked at 264 patients with type 2 diabetes and diagnosed with moderate and severe perio. The treatment group included root planning and surgery, followed by scaling and root planning every three months for one year. This control group had only super gingival cleaning only. Uh, and, and the HbA1c was both at 8.1% at baseline. The treatment group was reduced to 7.8% and the control group actually went up to 8.3% again because they, they know they have periodontal disease and did not uh, receive treatment. Also, obviously saw improvement in their periodontal disease. But interestingly, also vascular and kidney function and quality of life measures in patients who had the periodontal treatment. Um, so we know the vascular and endothelium changes that occur with periodontal disease, and we can improve those with periodontal treatment. So Cochrane did a review in 2022. They looked at over 35 randomized controlled trials with 30, over 3,200 uh, patients. Um, following periodontal treatment, moderate certainty evidence shows an absolute reduction in HbA1c of 0.43% at three to four months, 0.3% at six months, and 0.5% at 12 months of follow-up. Um, and it's, it's similar to adding a second medication to their pharmacologic regimen. Um, and they say no further studies are warranted as, as results are unlikely to change. There's enough evidence to say that we can reduce patients' HbA1c by simply treating their periodontal disease with scaling, root planning, and surgery. Um, so um, that's a great take-home message. And think if you can eliminate a second medication the patient takes, what it saves them in cost, but also what the side effects of those medications are. So the evidence is, is clear. <clears throat> We'll look at um, a few more studies. And, and so now we know if we have periodontal disease and we treat it, we can improve outcomes for diabetic patients. But um, this study looked at the severity of tooth loss, bleeding on probing, and poor response to periodontal treatment. Um, and are they associated with increased risk of future diabetes? And they found that, yes, it is. And this looked at nearly 9,000 patients followed over 35 years. The number of teeth and bleeding on probing at baseline were significantly related to incident diabetes after adjusting for confounders. So those who responded poorly to periodontal treatment and then later presented with incident diabetes was significantly larger compared with patients who responded to periodontal treatment, a 37% increased risk of developing diabetes if you did not respond as well to periodontal treatment as if you had. Um, so their result or conclusions were individuals with periodontal disease displaying increased tooth loss and bleeding and probing, as well as those who responded poorly to treatment were at higher risk of developing diabetes in the future. Again, we can inform our primary care uh, physicians who um, are taking care of patients who are maybe pre-diabetic um, that this patient isn't responding as well to treatment and they may be at higher risk for periodontal disease in the future. It also increased 
or leads to reduction in costs of healthcare. So simply treating periodontal disease can lead to savings in medical care. Um, this study um, uh, published in JAD in April 2023 um, uh, found that periodontal treatment was associated with reduced overall healthcare costs, 12% in patients with commercial insurance and 14% in patients with Medicaid. So from $1,800 to $2,500 in yearly savings for patients who are diabetic and receive periodontal treatment, including the cost of their, their periodontal treatment. So the take home message for patients with diabetics or, or with diabetes or, or who are diabetic, um, patients with periodontitis exhibit a higher chance of developing prediabetes and diabetes. Patients with type two diabetes have an increased risk of developing periodontitis. It's harder to control your A1C if you have periodontal disease and if your A1C is out of control, it's harder to manage your periodontal disease. Treatment of periodontal disease can lower the HbA1C nearly a half of a percentage point, which also decreases the risk of diabetes associated comorbidities. And that continued maintenance of good oral health is necessary to maintain the reductions in HbA1C. And that makes sense. We got to control the inflammation. So um, we'll move on to respiratory diseases. Um, uh, we know there are mechanisms of action that lead to, we're going to uh, concentrate on pneumonia primarily. Uh, we can aspirate oral pathogens and they get into the lungs. Uh, we know that periodontal disease associated enzymes actually alter the oral mucosal surfaces that enables respiratory pathogens to colonize in the mouth. And we know that the cytokines that originate from periodontal um, tissues that get into the bloodstream actually promote an inflammatory process in the lower respiratory tract, and that reduces the patient's immune response and makes them more susceptible to pneumonia and other respiratory infections. This study um, looked at the association between oral health and incidence of pneumonia, um, and it was done in Korea. And, and the results that they found was the, res the risk of pneumonia increased significantly in groups with a higher number of dental caries, cavities, and missing teeth. So 27% more likely to develop pneumonia if you had more cavities and were missing more teeth. And that the risk of pneumonia decreased significantly in patients with frequent toothbrushing and professional dental cleanings. So simply brushing your teeth two or more times a day and having dental cleanings reduced your risk of pneumonia by 15%. Um, whereas if you had more missing teeth or caries, it increased your risk of pneumonia. We think of the teeth um, as dentists, but we also need to be very, very aware of the tongue, especially related to pneumonia. And this was a study in 2018 looking at frail elderly patients who were in long-term care facilities. We, and th what they noted, they experienced more dysphagia. They have more trouble swallowing. We know that. Um, and that the elderly adults with poor oral health um, swallow a more dysbiotic microbiota formed on the tongue. Um, that's actually, we can test and find that. And that the dominant source of bad bugs in aspirated saliva came from the, the dorsum of the tongue. We know and can and type exactly what those bacteria uh, were and that those bad pathogens um, that uh, were predominantly in the tongue uh, were in patients who had fewer teeth, higher plaque index, and more caries. So uh, we need to remember the tongue when we're educating our patients and other caregivers about uh, patients who are at higher risk for pneumonia. This study by Hong actually looked at 60 patients who were in a nursing home facility. 17 of the 60 developed pneumonia. The risk factors were calculus index and colonization of the tongue with Pseudomonas and Haemophilus, which are respiratory pathogens. So 90% of patients who developed pneumonia harbored these respiratory pathogens on the tongue rather than in the plaque. And that uh, their conclusions, mechanical removal of tongue biofilm and calculus to eradicate specific bacterial species may be needed to reduce pneumonia development from oral sources. So if grandma's in the nursing home, we know oral health care is neglected in those patients or any long-term rehab facility, we need to reinforce the need to um, have good oral rinses, good oral care, and to, to clean the tongue by brushing or by a tongue sweeper or some other mechanical device that can remove um, the pathogens from the tongue. 
Ventilator associated pneumonia is the second most common hospital acquired infection um, and is the leading cause of death for patients who are critically ill in the ICU. It's associated with gastric aspiration. We bring bugs up from, from our stomach into the mouth and then they're aspirated into the um, respiratory tract. Oral pharyngeal pathogens are uh, cultured um, in elderly nursing home patients and hospitalized patients. Um, uh, the oral plaque colonizes with the res uh, uh, respiratory pathogens and enteric pathogens. So we know they're there and we need to be able to better control them, especially in patients who um, are hooked up to uh, or intubated or on a ventilator. Cochrane did a review and, and found high quality evidence that chlorhexidine reduces the risk of ven ventilator associated pneumonia from 24 to 18%. So that means for every 17 patients treated with chlorhexidine, you prevent one ventilator associated pneumonia. And that's a huge cost savings, thirty to $50,000 if a patient gets pneumonia while on a ventilator and also increases their risk of deaths. Um, limited evidence, the effects of toothbrushing on the risk of uh, developing va uh, ventilator associated pneumonia. So we need to make sure that patient that our, our, our critical care providers have oral health care regimens into, and they all do in, in good hospitals, certainly, into their um, uh, patients on ventilators. Hospital acquired pneumonia is where we're gonna be more likely to have an impact and where we as patients are more likely at risk. We know that uh, resident oral uh, bacteria and aspiration potential as well as host factors are uh, common factors that, that can lead you to hospital acquired pneumonia. 85% of hospitalized patients have respiratory pathogens in their dental plaque and on the buccal mucosa versus 39% of non-hospitalized patients. So simply going to the hospital leads to increased respiratory pathogens in the dental plaque and, and, and I'm sure tongue as well as bu buccal mucosa. Risk of hospital uh, acquired pneumonia 9.6 times higher if you simply go into the ICU when we find um, respiratory pathogens in the dental plaque and we do 85% of the time. Um, and um, uh, we know that it actually occurs in all types of patients. We think, ah, only elderly patients are at risk for pneumonia. But 51% in studies occur in patients under the age of 65, and they happen in every single unit. So you go in to get your appendix out, and you get pneumonia while you're there, even though you're an otherwise young, healthy patient, simply because um, the uh, your microbiome in the mouth changes dramatically once you enter the hospital or routines change. The types of bacteria that are in the hospital itself we may acquire. Our diet changes, certainly our oral hygiene changes, um, and we're all at greater risk of pneumonia simply by entering a hospital. So how might we prevent nosocomial or hospital acquired infections with oral care? This study published in June of 2023 in the Journal of Evidence-Based Dental Practice um, did a, again, a, a systematic review. 11 of the 12 studies showed that intensified oral care regimens while in the hospital led to a reduction in ventilator-associated pneumonia and non-ventilator hospital um, associate or acquired pneumonia. It reduced the days in the hospital, hospital costs, and the need for taking antibiotics, obviously, if you get pneumonia um, for patients um, who received intensified care. All very, very good things, simply by helping them brush their teeth and using oral rinses. Let's not forget our edentulous patients. Um, this study looked at patients who were denture wearers and they were hospitalized with pneumonia um, uh, versus denture wearers who did not develop pneumonia. There was a 20-fold increase in the bio burden of respiratory pathogens on dentures of patients who develop pneumonia um, and that dentures are a potential source of infection for pneumonia. We should make sure we do proper cleaning and disinfection of dentures even before, if a, a patient goes into the hospital, they wear dentures, they, they develop pneumonia while they're there. Those dentures need to be disinfected um, uh, or they're carrying those pathogens home again and they're at high risk for reinfection. So our take home message relative to respiratory diseases, patients with poor oral health and untreated cavities and periodontal disease may have increased risk for COPD and pneumonia. Bacteria from the mouth are frequently aspirated in the lungs. The tongue harbors pathogenic bacteria, even in patients without teeth. 
hospitalized patients with poor oral health are at increased risk of uh, pneumonia, regardless of their age and reason for admission. And oral hygiene is extremely important for hospitalized patients to lower the risk of pneumonia in, in hospital settings. Now we'll look at dementia. Um, uh, Alzheimer's disease being the primary uh, thing and, and sadly such a growing um, uh, number of patients uh, who develop this as we age. We know it's associated with beta amyloid protein deposits in the brain and neurofibrillary tangles. Um, inflammation is a key factor in the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease. We know that for sure. What are the risk factors for Alzheimer's disease? Smoking, depression, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, age, stroke, and traumatic brain injuries, all are risk factors. Many of those are risk factors for periodontal disease as well. But could periodontal disease actually be a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease? And there's a lot of uh, um, uh, research that's showing that it, that it is. Infectious diseases associated with low-grade inflammation may play a substantial role in the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease. Those are what researchers say. They found these different microbes in the brains of patients with Alzheimer's disease, Borrelia, Treponema, P. Uh, P. gingivalis, E. coli, oral fungi, uh, Candida, and F. nucleatum. Three or four of those are common oral inhabitants. So we know that they certainly may be. P. gingivalis, is probably the most common, commonly studied. And so if we look at um, a study done in uh, uh, mice, middle-aged mice, um, and they uh, simply administered the lipopolysaccharides from P. gingivalis to these mice, um, it, it uh, led to learning and memory de deficits. We consider P. gingivalis as the master immune evader and immunosuppressor. Um, we know we, it invades coronary arteries. We know it invades the endothelium of all blood vessels, and then it releases inflammatory cytokines that um, uh, can cause further problems. <clears throat> we know that P. gingivalis lipopolysaccharides contain enzymes which actually contribute to the degradation of endothelial cells and the loss of the blood-brain barrier integrity. Um, P. gingivalis and the, their lipopolysaccharides are found in the amyloid plaques of autopsy brains of Alzheimer's disease patients, but not in the normal brain tissue um, in those same patients with Alzheimer's disease. Inflammatory mediators, those cytokines that are, are, are put into the bloodstream by um, a patient or with patients with periodontal disease, activate microglia and promote amyloid production as well as enhancing the blood brain uh, barrier permeability. None of those are good things, obviously. Dr. Alzheimer himself, uh, more than a century ago, uh, suggested that senile plaque formation, which is what he called it in his research, uh, was likely the result of microbial infection. So this has been a common um, uh, thought in research since um, its discovery by Dr. Alzheimer's. Domini did a study um, in 2019, um, and they found that P. gingivalis gingipanes promote neuronal damage and are found in greater than 90% of brain tissue biopsies of uh, Alzheimer's disease patients, and that they can also be found in the cerebrospinal fluid and brain tissue. They claim that P. gingivalis could be a causative factor. I think that's probably a leap too far, as does Dr. Robert Moore who's quoted down below. Um, but they were able to develop gingipain inhibitors that block the gingipain-induced neurodegeneration. So you could, um, they, they studied and said, we're gonna get broad spectrum antibiotics to try and kill the P. gingivalis, thus there'll be no gingipains there. Uh, that had no effect on the uh, neurogeneration, but if you inhibited the gingipain, the virulence factors themselves, that actually had an effect on um, the neurodegeneration. So could we look at um, possible treatment as periodontal disease to slow um, Alzheimer's disease progression? Chen did a study of a 10-year exposure to chronic periodontitis, um, and his results were that it led to a 1.7-fold increase in the risk of developing uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease. Lira did a study that uh, said the presence of periodontal disease has a significant association with Alzheimer's disease. 
um, a 69% greater risk of Alzheimer's disease. And that severe periodontal disease showed a stronger association, uh, almost nearly a three times greater association with periodontal disease. Um, that um, there was an interventional study showing that um, effectively treating periodontitis can lead to improvements in cognition. But again, we have to be careful to say there's not causation of periodontal disease and Alzheimer's disease, but it, it may be a risk factor. And we also have to be um, very aware um, that obviously patients who develop Alzheimer's disease um, lose their ability to maintain proper oral hygiene, increasing their risk for periodontal disease, their progression of periodontal disease, their inflammation, and uh, uh, poor nutrition. All of these things could lead to reverse causality, that it wasn't the periodontal disease that caused Alzheimer's disease, it was Alzheimer's disease that led to the periodontal disease. Um, so we have to be cautious when we look at studies and the relationship of periodontal disease to Alzheimer's disease. This study um, published in June of uh, 2022 um, looked at Fusobacterium nucleatum um, and that it exacerbates Alzheimer's pathogenesis and how does it do that? So they found that F. nucleatum, common periodontal pathogen, actually activates micro, uh, microglial cells in vitro, which promotes proliferation and, and uh, increased inflammatory response. The microglial cells cause neuroinflammation. Um, and that in a mouse model, um, F. nucleatum accelerates the development of disease by promoting inflammatory response to the brain and exacerbates the behavioral and pathological manifestations of Alzheimer's disease. They did not find the bug in the brain, but just the lipopolysaccharides and other cytokines um, from the bacteria. Um, this study in the Journal of Alzheimer's uh, looked at clinical and bacterial markers of periodontitis and their association with incident, all-cause, and Alzheimer's disease dementia. Um, they did a 26-year follow follow-up of patients with periodontal disease, and what was their likelihood of developing dementia or Alzheimer's disease? This study provides evidence for an association between periodontal pathogens and Alzheimer's disease. Effectiveness of periodontal pathogen treatment on reducing sequelae of neurodegeneration should be tested in future studies. So our take home message, inflammation is associated with Alzheimer's disease and periodontal disease is obviously a chronic inflammatory disease. Um, the bad bugs and the toxins they produce can be found in the disease or in the brain and that patients with periodontal disease have higher rates of Alzheimer's disease. And it's from our standpoint, we need to be aware these patients need um, more help with their oral health um, to prevent them from getting cavities and uh, periodontal disease. Look at cancer. Um, we know that 24% uh, higher risk of first primary cancer in pa uh, patients with severe periodontal disease and even higher with uh, patients who are edentulous, positive associations with lung cancer, oral cancer, colorectal, and most digestive diseases. There is biologic plausibility because we know that um, just periodontal pathogens can increase tumor burden in an animals. Oral and oral pharyngeal cancers, um, we should be well aware of. They account for 3% of all cancers. Um, we know the risk factors are alcohol and tobacco primarily, but um, and that squamous cell carcinomas account for 90% of all head and neck carcinomas. But there were two studies that measured um, bone levels, meaning periodontal disease, and those with bone loss reported strong associations um, uh, with the risk of oral cancer. But remember, patients who smoke and use alcohol are more likely to have periodontal disease. So it may not be the periodontal disease, it might be the other risk factors. Um, positive association between oral cancer and the number of teeth uh, lost as well. Um, uh, strong associations with periodontitis and oral pharyngeal and esophageal cancers in patients who never smoke. And we can get it down to the exact bugs, P. gingivalis and Tanarelia uh, forsythia of adenocarcinomas and uh, squamous cell carcinomas. This study um, uh, looked at esophageal and gastric cancers. Um, 150,000 patients found a, a history of periodontal disease with, uh, associated with a 43% and 52% increased risk of esophageal and gastric cancers. Um, we know that um, 
oral hygiene prom promotes the formation of nitrosamines, which have been known to cause um, cancer. And we know, again, the bugs that um, are associated with those cancers. This study, um, association among periodontitis and Heliobacter pylori, we know Heliobacter pylori is causative for gastric cancers and ulcers. So um, uh, periodontitis is proposed to lead to increased H. pylori infections. Um, and it looked at nearly 5,000 um, patients who had both a periodontal exam and then they tested them for H. pylori. Patients with periodontal disease um, were, uh, higher likelihood of actually um, having an H. pylori infection as well, 27% increased risk, and that their all-cause mortality from any types of cancers, if you found periodontal disease and H. pylori, was increased um, with multiple different cancers. Oral pharyngeal cancers are what we should be most aware of, obviously, 75% are HPV related. HPV 16 and 18 are the causative pathogens for 85 to 19, 90% of them. 80% of the population will, will come in contact with HPV in their lifetime. 99% of us clear it with no symptoms. We have to realize it is a sexually transmitted disease, but it doesn't require penetration. Simply skin to skin contact can, uh, uh, cause contamination with HPV. White non-smoking males age 35 to 60 are most at risk. And we should be aware when our patients tell us that, geez, I've had pain with swallowing or maybe uh, I feel like I got a lump in my throat. I have a sore throat or hoarse voice, a lump in the neck, unilateral earache persisting for several days or constant coughing. These are all potential signs of oral pharyngeal cancers. And we should be aware of those and be referring to them to our colleagues and ear, nose, and throat to make sure they're checked if they're telling us of those symptoms. Um, we know there are vaccines. Unfortunately, they're very underutilized um, uh, because we know that they can prevent um, uh, cervical cancers, but also they are approved for head and neck cancers, and we should be promoting them to our, our uh, patients. Pancreatic cancers, we know multiple studies associating P. gingivalis and AA. i um, not going to go through them because um, pancreatic cancer is a, a tough one and, and we, we don't know what the cause, but there are associations. Colorectal cancer and the GI tract cancers are areas where there are more um, evidence to show associations. And F. nucleatum, interestingly, actually is shown to accelerate the growth and progression of colorectal cancers. It's not associated um, with being a cause, but it's just a passenger that rides along and the cancer actually allows the bacteria to grow more and um, it protects it from the immune cells so they can't get there. But also um, this study showed, no, annexin A1 is a protein that actually stimulates colorectal cancer growth and that F nucleatum when found in, in these tumors increases the production of annexin A1 so it fuels the cancer growth and that simply the presence of an X and A1 or F nucleatum worsens your prognosis of colorectal cancer, regardless of its grade, stage, age, or sex. And so these are things that are important as patients or to, and, and where we might do salivary diagnostics, say, hey, you've got this bug, um, you're at higher risk for bad outcomes um, if you get colorectal cancers. So the take home message, um, uh, while the relative risk for cancer may not be very large, the, the associations ob observed are significant just because so many patients have periodontal disease. We know there's links between inflammation and cancer, um, P. gingivalis and other um, bugs. We may be able to do bacterial assays as predictors for cancer risk or outcomes related to cancers. And then should we be advocating for um, dental coverage and health insurance plans for patients who are at high risk uh, of, of cancer. Um, we'll wrap up with rheumatoid arthritis and then pregnancy, and then how we uh, incorporate this into our practices. Rheumatoid arthritis, um, women much more than men, doesn't affect a lot of people, but it's very debilitating. They're both immunoinflammatory diseases. They both destroy bone. They have common inflammatory markers that we know about. And we know that um, the alteration of arginine to citrulline is implicated as a major role in rheumatoid arthritis. Um, as arginine changes to citrulline, um, the body recognizes it as foreign 
and it produces auto, auto antibodies, which starts to cause the inflammatory process in the joint and degrade the bone and, and um, uh, uh, other structures in the joint. P. gingivalis is the only bacteria that's been demonstrated to actually be able to cause citrullination of arginine to citrulline, increasing autoantibodies and inflammation in the joints. And oftentimes in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, we find uh, antibodies to P. gingivalis. Um, when patients have, who have rheumatoid arthritis have been treated uh, um, for periodontal disease, um, we see that their uh, rheumatoid arthritis um, uh, reduced severity uh, as measured by their disease activity score. So they have a reduction in the number of tender and swollen joints and also reduction in this uh, tumor necrosis factor and the erythrocyte sedimentation rate, which all leads to better outcomes in patients with rheumatoid arth arthritis. Um, untreated periodontal disease could be an aggravating factor in those who don't respond to rheumatoid arthritis treatments through their medications. Um, so was there a bidirectional relationship between rheumatoid arthritis and periodontitis? No. When you um, look at a review, if you treat rheumatoid arthritis, does the periodontal disease get better? It doesn't. Um, but periodontal disease is associated with substantially worse rheumatoid disease activity. Um, and when you treat the periodontal disease, you see better outcomes for um, patients with it. Patients um, uh, who have periodontal disease um, generally see more flare-ups of their rheumatoid arthritis. Again, the bacteria may just simply be provoking an immune response that causes the body to attack its own, own joint, that chronic inflammatory process. So the take-home message, um, rheumatoid arthritis and periodontal disease are both immunoinflammatory disorders, which both lead to the destruction of bone. Specific periodontal pathogens and their toxins can be found in the joints of these patients and increase autoantibody production and inflammation of the joints. And patients with periodontal disease have uh, been shown to have worse rheumatoid arthritis and treatment uh, of periodontal disease has been shown to decrease symptoms. And finally, pregnancy, um, uh, preterm birth and low birth weight. Uh, we know what normal gestation is. We know that um, 12 to 13 percent of the population uh, U.S. pregnancies end in preterm or low birth weight. We know we can find oral bacteria in the amniotic fluid and the placenta. That causes, again, an inflammatory process, cytokine release, and may reduce growth factors to enable the, the baby to grow properly. Uh, associations with periodontal disease and preterm birth and low birth weight. Way back in 1996, the first connections that we saw in oral health systemic health. But there's no clear uh, a difference in preterm births um, by a Cochrane study between paratreatment and no treatment and low quality evidence that paratreatment may reduce low birth weight. So you got to be able to treat it and see improvements, but there are a few areas where we might. Pregnancy is important to us regardless of whether there's strong associations. We know babies are born without bacteria in their mouth, and we, the providers and particularly parents um, uh, for these children, give them our bacteria. So if mothers have bad periodontal disease, they're giving it to their children. Um, and so we know that puts that child at risk for um, uh, future problems and that all, all children should be seen for an H1 uh, dental visit. This was a, a very interesting study, um, xylitol gum and preterm birth. And it was done in Malawi, which has the highest preterm birth rate in the world. Looked at 10,000 women and they educated them on preterm birth risks in pregnancy and improving oral health. Half of those 10,000 received xylitol gum. 70% of them, uh, the majority had cavities or, or gum disease at the start. Those who chewed xylitol gum and had, uh, had preterm birth rates of 12.6% versus 16.5% for those who did not chew xylitol gum, 24% reduction. Um, xylitol has been shown to reduce cavities and decrease inflammation. So we look at this and say, well, so what? This is a very simple thing in high-risk populations who have low dental IQs and don't get good pregnancy care, simply having giving them oral hygiene instruction and having them chew um, xylitol gum may reduce um, preterm births uh, for that, that population. Um, finally, with gestational diabetes, an interesting study that was just published in 2022 looked at 3,500 pregnant women, 
and compared women with periodontal disease. Some had treatment, some were not treated. And those with peri without periodontal disease, weeks one through four gestation. 11.2% of the women with untreated periodontal disease uh, developed gestational diabetes versus 4.8% without periodontal disease. So those with treated peri uh, perio reduced uh, from 11.2 to 7.3%. So treatment actually helped reduce or um, gestational diabetes. Again, this is information we can share with our patients who are planning to get pregnant or get pregnant and with uh, their care providers, their OBGYNs, that gestational diabetes might be able to be controlled by simply controlling their periodontal disease. So I'm not going to read through the message. We just did it on pregnancy because I want to get to how we integrate this and we're running short on time. But oral health systemic health has a lot of other areas that we can look at. Um, we know that there are cost savings just simply. We saw some of that earlier, but multiple studies that show cost savings with dental treatment, um, including the cost of dental treatment, actually reduces medical costs particularly in patients with diabetes and coronary artery disease. So we should be getting this to our policymakers. But the take home message, the three most important contributors to oral health systemic health connection, inflammation, 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 can't drive that home, uh, point home strong enough. Um, so how do we apply it to our practice? Um, I, I told you about this a little bit, but this was the study that showed um, these interferon lambdas are produced by epithelial cells in the mouth and protect us from viral infections and that P. gingivalis can actually completely suppress that interferon production. Just remarkable um, that that alone might be due. So what do we do? We should educate our elderly patients and patients who have significant health changes, how it impacts their oral health. Patients with gingival recession are at higher risk for caries. That might be very stable while they're young and healthy, but that can lead to rapid oral health deterioration if they have a significant health change or just simply aging as a health change. Those health changes include Parkinson's, dementia, stroke, arthritis, depression, makes it harder to clean the teeth, puts them at greater risk. Um, uh, changes in the oral microbiome and, and their immune response happens as patients develop these chronic health conditions and simply as the age and that puts them again at much higher risk for, for um, dental disease as well. So we need to advise our patients that they need to see us more often, not less often when they have significant health changes and that we should be increasing their prevention members. Could we be culturing oral micro, uh, the oral microbiome and doing a risk analysis for caries and periodontal disease, doing customized recalls, fluorides? And should patients with specific systemic diseases have insurance coverage for dental care? These are the questions that we ask, but we need to be careful in salivary diagnostics and we find red pathogens that are there, P. gingivalis, F. nucleatum, all those ones, because a lot of these recommend using antibiotics. And I'd strongly encourage you to be cautious with that because if you do and they don't have active infection and they get C. diff or some other bad outcome, you may be responsible. So that be very, very cautious in the diagnostics and then prescribing um, antibiotics. Again, hospitalized patients and ICU patients, we need to do improved oral hygiene. Last slide, educate our patients on the value of good oral health and where it may impact systemic health. Use it to motivate patients to improve their oral health and to see us more regularly educate our physicians and other uh, healthcare providers, especially those paid with outcomes. So a physician says, I'm paid by Medicare on how well I control their HbA1c. Hey, send them to me and we'll get their periodontal um, uh, health better and you're going to get paid better. We should be referring to our physician colleagues and they should be referring to us. Could we become primary care healthcare providers screening for cholesterol and other types of things? Um, we need a better collaborative education model with our physician colleagues, and we need to be aware of chronic inflammation and that regardless of any of these connections, good oral health provides better quality of life regardless of its impact on systemic health. And I appreciate your attention, and I know we're right at the end, and, and hopefully have time for a few questions that we might get.